I want to thank you all for coming today. This is really exciting for me. Typically, I lecture to students, and I have my pep talk planned for them going out into the world. But I thought, well, I don't need to tailor it too much, because we're LA's finest creative people here, waking up early, so we must be the best of the best. <laughs> and I, I want to talk first, the subject of shock may or may not apply to me. I think shock is kind of a nice, naive term, kind of an old-fashioned term, because there's so little that will shock us anymore. But perhaps given in a context of a museum, were you to wander into one of my installations, you might feel surprise or haunting or even perhaps shock, because it isn't the typical thing you would see in a museum. But that only covers one aspect of my work. I work in collage, um, music, film, uh, sculpture, costuming, and recently I just did my first feature film. And so I want to talk more about my trajectory of how I made it to this point in my life and the very windy path that I took to get here. Because I think as creative people, we all do juggle many, many things. You have a, perhaps if you're lucky enough, you have a creative job and then you come home and maybe you have another aspect to work you like to do, like photography or art or something else that you're pursuing. Then you add a relationship to that and perhaps children and suddenly it becomes a huge overload. And so over the years I've found that since I work in a lot of different mediums and I've had many, many successes and failures, that I've begun to look at my life as a body of work rather than what I'm doing right now. And that has really helped me ease a lot of the pressure and tension because I can look back and think, wow, that was a lot. And so um, I'm going to start where I, I started. And that was, there we go. I started as a punk rocker. I was 19. I joined a band. I said to my parents, I don't need college. I'm going to go join a band and travel the world and be a big success. And my father, who was an art historian, said, well, you might want to have a backup plan. You should go to college and study art. So that was already an unusual circumstance that I was encouraged to go into the arts. and. I said, well, OK, it beats a day job for now. So I went to USC for a couple years, and then um, UCLA for a couple years. My dad was teaching Asian art history at USC, and so I got to go free there. And then he retired, and then I switched over to UCLA, which was a great move because I got to study with people like Chris Burden in performance and Alexis Smith in collage. And so I learned quite a bit there, but I also juggled the band at night. This particular band was called Party Boys, and we played downtown a lot. And it was an art rock band, and we put out several records, and we toured. And I primarily played bass. That was my thing. Here's some of us over the years in different venues. Through that band, I learned that if somebody doesn't give you an opportunity to play, then you just find a bar and you play for free beer. And so that was typically what we did. And I continued that throughout my whole life. If I never waited for a gallery to give me a show. I would do shows with friends. I just always kind of just kept moving. Uh, this is some of the output that we had over the seven years as a band, uh, several records, um, uh, many, many, many shows. And it was a good experience for me to learn about making records and performing live. When the band broke up, I was at a loss. I thought I had been devoted seven years to my life. Thank God I got that art degree, according to my parents. Um, <laughs> And I thought, well, this is the early 80s. 
performance art is really happening in Los Angeles, I'm going to be, do performance art. And so this is the first character I came up with, and this is um, Coquette, the circus girl. <laughs> and her story, I thought, well, I could use a narrative because um, I won't be flailing around on stage so much without a narrative, with a narrative. And so it, she comes to Los Angeles, she wants to be a big success, and she ends up falling into the porn movies and the porn industry. And at that time, I made my first Super 8 film with Coquette, and it's basically her frolicking with this stuffed animal that I got it in a thrift store and impaled myself through. <laughs> Over the years, I had performed as an old woman each time with different narratives, making up my, my own songs. Uh, it was a challenge because I had never been on stage alone, so I took an acting class. Um, I, I always wore a mask or some sort of covering to just get over my stage fright. Uh, here's one uh, outer space person and the eye prison. Uh, flower, this, her name's Happy, and her story goes that she went into the woods and the woodland creatures said, you better become an animal because you're not going to survive here long as a flower. So she chooses a bunny, but unfortunately bunnies do become victims in the forest. And so she had a bit of a rough start out in the forest as a bunny. Here she's telling her problems to the frog. And I did a series of, of films and collages that had to do with the character of Happy. Over the years, this is some of my output. I um, continued to do a little bit with Sonic Youth. I did some of their posters, and then I made special edition records, 100 records each. Each one had a different cover, and then I would have a, a show in a gallery of all the different covers, and they would sell for $100 each, and it would fund the project. I'm still doing that today. Famish was my most recent 100 edition. That was a more of a collaboration and an exquisite corpse where each member of the band did something on the cover. Um, and so this was a way to continue to f fund my music. I never really had any uh, success, never got played on the radio. Uh, let's see if I could think of other ways I felt unsuccessful. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Well, anyway, the list goes on, believe me. And so then I began to get discouraged. Many of my friends were showing now in museums and galleries, and I was still performing to the same 15 people downtown. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this is crazy. I think I better start putting more into my movies. And so I came up with another movie. This was a Super 8 film shot at the Salton Sea, and that's a character, Destiny, and she goes out and she finds a bunch of blow-up animals. If you would like to see my movies, some of them can be found online. Unfortunately, I can't show them here today because of the time constraints. Uh, this is another one, the red nurse and the snowman. She goes out into the snow and looks for animals that are injured or hurt, and she realizes that she's actually been fooled by these animals, that they're just trying to control and manipulate her. <laughs> so. My costumes began to get more and more elaborate. I, 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 one thing I don't do is sew, so I had some people help me s do some of the sewing, but I clued them all together. This was a night, a film, I, a video that I shot at night. Uh, this is some of the characters, a large group of um, creatures, and they're looking for something from the magical unicorn who can't speak, and so they look down into the pond and they find some sort of magic down there. And then they got to be more elaborate because at this time people began to respond more to my movies and they wanted to show them. And so I had quite a few movies under my belt at this point and I realized that it was a great way to get my work over to Europe because people don't want to spend the money on shipping. I recently had a quote for shipping 20 costumes to my show in Geneva and it was $5,000 round trip. And so that's really prohibitive. So this is something I always tell uh, students is that it's 
great to make videos because you can just upload them and you will suddenly be having shows everywhere. <laughs> so, so, that, so that's, um, this one was called The Ghost Trees and uh, you notice the five trees have these plastic face masks which I found because I wanted them to look anonymous like mannequins. And so uh, the lead is me and I run through the forest. I think I'm looking to be free. Uh, I think I've been imprisoned by a bear and I break the chains here. From the ghost trees, that inspired a bit of this band called the Spirit Girls, which was a band that I started out of a lack of of, it, it, it started from a feeling of lack when I was growing up in the 70s. I went to see a lot of theatrical rock shows and they were primarily men on stage uh, such as I, the, you know, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, even Black Sabbath, the, the prog rock bands, yes, Genesis. I loved all the costumes, I loved the theatricality of it, but I realized that there really weren't any women in theatrical rock bands. So I was driving down the street one day, which is where most of our ideas come from in Los Angeles, and <laughs> I thought to myself, well, I'll just create a band that was meant to grow up, be, be a band in the 70s, but they died tragically. So the Spirit <laughs> Girls... <laughs> So the Spirit Girls came about, I thought, well, okay, this is a band, and they performed in the 70s, but they died, and so they will hold shows, they'll put on shows and perform, put, they'll put up flyers and they'll perform, but nobody will show up except animals. So this kind of, because animals have this special psychic ability to see spirits and go to shows of bands with just spirits. So I made my first film about these girls performing to a group of animals and I had got, gathered all my animal costumes together and put them in the audience and shot the movie. And um, it, 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 I, it was very successful. So I thought to myself, well, I'm just gonna pursue this band for about five years. And we put out this CD, this is the cover. I'm always the one with the long red hair. And we did many, many shows in, in theaters, in clubs. Um, and then I made four Spirit Girls films. Um, let me think. Oh, and collages that were Spirit Girls based. And so this was the very first time in my life that all, the different, all of my different interests came together. And I felt very complete and very good because I had always felt very scattered. And this is really the first time it all merged. And so I, it, I, I thought that's really nice. But um, when I come up with an idea, I feel like if it doesn't go away, then I have to pursue that idea or I'm not being honest to myself. And so this is how I approach really large projects. It's like if they don't go away, I wish they'd go away, but they don't. So then I just keep going. And so this is how Spirit Girls came about. Here's the band, the story goes that this particular one is online at the MOCA Museum of Contemporary Art website. Um, the lead singer leaves the band to go pursue her own career as a solo artist. She gets caught up in a, a sideshow cir circus channeling spirits and this was a bit inspired by um, the spiritualism movement um, from the previous turn of the century. And uh, this is the band that she gets caught up with. They're uh, clowns and an evil donkey guy and a, and a pig. And so they tie her up and they basically make money off of her in this sideshow. The Spirit Girls, in the first three movies, they never spoke. And I thought, well, it's time for them to sp speak. And so I thought, well, what could be better than to have a ventriloquist doll speak for you? So I had someone who had ventriloquist doll uh, experience and he made the heads and I got the mannequins from uh, online. And so then we had, I had the matching dresses made. And so this is my four, fourth or fifth Spirit Girls film. And um, this is called Sea of Silence. And when the girls finally get their voices, they, all they do is tell dumb barroom jokes. And, <laughs> mixed with philo really heavy philosophy. And then this is how a Spirit Girls show was 
put up. This was Patrick Painter in Santa Monica. Uh, the collages on the wall are, are, are large scale. I would build dioramas in my studio and then photograph them and then insert cut and paste with actual scissors and glue the spirit girls within the collages. Some of the large scale animals are made from taxidermy things I found online which are really quite reasonable and then you can add the different um, uh, different accoutrements to, to decorate them. And I wanted the toys to look like giant toys blown up from childhood um, on a large scale and then the seating and then you've got a ghost clown in there as well. This is one of the collages. This is a large scale collage. This was about a little life size. Uh, I would say about six feet tall, four feet wide. And um, as you can see, it's a little rooster. I bought at one of those um, figurine shops. And then I dress up in different costumes and I collage myself on them. Over the years, I, this was before Photoshop and I kept getting, is it, now I keep getting, is it Photoshopped, is it Photoshop? So I've moved into more paint and actual hand cutting because what I want my pieces to be are unique pieces, one of a kind. I want people to feel that special feeling they felt when they got the special edition record that this record nobody else in the world will have because it, I just think in this day and age when everything becomes so digital, it's nice that we have special things that are unique. Here's uh, the Spirit Girls, um, and this is a nice one in terms of speaking about shock. The Spirit Girls coming from the 70s, they're a little bit repressed. They wear white gloves. They haven't quite made the transition into the, the, the scene of the 70s. And s metaphorically, the stallion comes racing through the picnic, and they all sort of cower to themselves. And I tried to create it like a scene in a movie. Each collage is like an individual scene in a movie. And I want to have some sort of psychological or emotional thing happening within the collage. Here the girls are levitating up. The backgrounds are now becoming painted and then photographed. Um, that's me as a scarecrow. I also performed as a scarecrow quite a bit. This is when the lead spirit girl can't take it anymore and she, with her psychic powers, she burns down the circus. And that was a little circus tent that I and my assistants made and we actually put it on a grill and lit it on fire. <laughs> this, I, if you've been to MOCA, this is one of my installations that's in their permanent collection. It's called Giggles of Clowns, and that idea came about because I grew up loving clowns, Red Skelton, and uh, Giggles of Clowns is an actual term that clowns use as a group of clowns. And um, when a clown dies, many of you may know that the clowns come to the funeral in clown clothes. It's a sign of respect. So I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. I wanted to put the spirit girls to rest, and I thought, well, I'll put the lead spirit girl on a bed of flowers um, and the clowns will gather around and they will laugh and cry over the corpse. And so I uh, made a soundtrack of clowns laughing and crying and squeaking their little horns and, um, and it's, it, 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 it kind of cracked me up because sometimes the, the laughing and the crying, it's really hard to tell if someone's laughing or crying. So, each one was made, I got a mannequin, um, I got the old man and old lady masks at the mask store, filled them with expanding foam, plopped them on top of the mannequin, then coated them in two coats of that resin that you get at Home Depot, and then painted them in acrylic. It's very simple DIY kind of stuff, but, and then I went to the different thrift stores and got clothes that looked like clowns would wear, and then I found a Christian clown clothing company online, <laughs> and, I got a couple of the suits because they were very reasonable. And uh, so that, that's the installation, I'm very happy. Here's uh, one of the close-ups of the artist clown. He's a very, he, he's a bit of a narcissist. He's just looking up at the so sky and thinking about his work and not thinking about the corpse in the room. <laughs> so there he goes. Um, then I began to get into monsters simply because I realized that there were 
it's a great metaphor for monsters under the bed facing your own demons, um, bringing things out that have been repressed or submerged. And I try to make my characters have a, a, be alter egos of myself. And so this is the um, monster girl in the boat. Um, this is no longer a spirit girl. And these are her comrades, and they're in a journey called Happy Go Lucky. The soundtrack, this is in a museum. I had a retrospective of my work in um, Le near Lyon, France, about four or five years ago. And the giant mural was painted in place, and then we got the boat on eBay. And I sent just the heads, and they got the mannequins over there, and I dressed them. And. Um, Oh, so, oh, and the soundtrack is waves crashing and a uh, woman moaning. So it's almost uh, like she's kind of going to her death, but she's uh, okay with it because she's a happy-go-lucky person. That's how I kind of read that um, piece. Here's a close-up. There's Those uh, flowers are silk flowers dipped in um, white glue, made hard, and then hand painted. And the seaweed is, um, th is just acrylic paint poured onto sheets of plastic, let dry, and then cut out. So again, a sort of DIY stuff. This is a more um, a project I did at Cal Arts with some film students. I showed them my monsters and I did it like Project One Runway. You have to make monsters <laughs> like, like I do to be in my movie and work for me. And so a lot of them, I brought many of these actually from home because m many of them uh, didn't really, they, they just weren't crude and weird enough. But the bloody chicken was my favorite and he was just, um, you, you just don't get as, anything as good as that. Um, uh, here I am as the silent film star. I'm going to go through the slides a bit long, faster. I got to show this film in a mausoleum in Altadena and perform as with a backdrop. Uh, in the gallery, I was able to show my collages, which um, have now photographic backgrounds of cemeteries I like to frequent. Here's some of the other characters. Uh, here's one of the collages, the praying girls. This is a show I did in Lille, France, where they wanted a spirit girls show. And I said, no, I don't do the spirit girls anymore, but I will um, have an effigy of a spirit girl. And here she lies with her animal friends um, gathered around. She's a resuscitation doll in actuality. Here's some of the characters. I tend to just ship costumes and put them on mannequins when I get there. This is very recent. I just finished this. It opened in September. This is, I uh, applied to, uh, uh, to do a show at the mattress factory. They pay for the entire installation because as you can imagine, these installations even though they're pretty DIY, they do end up costing money. So I applied and I got it, and we built a three-quarter scale ghost train in the space. I chose the basement space because I thought it looked like a train. I grew up, um, I, I lived in Taiwan for a year when my dad was studying Chinese bronzes, and so I grew up near a train track there, and I love the steam engines because of the metaphors of them being beasts or creatures or alive or breathing. And, and that was when the first time in my life that I was awakened to the term metaphor. So then the project was that I went to a bunch of different, th it was my idea, I went to a bunch of different thrift stores and I made these, um, or there's a couple of the more theatrical, it's almost as if the train is disintegrating as it goes. Here's the, P I sent the heads from my studio and then built the bodies out of things I found at the thrift stores in Pittsburgh. I spent two weeks going to different thrift stores and buying things. I chose mostly handcrafted things. I also brought the clown suit from home because I was afraid I couldn't get a clown suit. So uh, that, that was, oops, here's some of the other figures. I like this project because many times 
pe your creative people are invited to go to a city to do a project about the city, and I don't like it when people go to a city and they tell the people who live in the city what is their city about because they know better than they do. But I wanted to incorporate something from the city, so going to the thrift stores was perfect because you can find you know, that beautiful sad puppy painting. <laughs> uh, this was a performance, we're going a little bit back in time. Uh, Jack Black invited me to make 20 monster costumes for last year's Festival Supreme, not this year's Festival Supreme. And then he said, this, do the Spirit Girls want to perform? And I said, no, we've broken up. And here we are performing again. And, um, but it, it was, a lot of it was hinged on the fact that my lead guitar player didn't want to dress like a girl anymore because he wasn't actually a girl. So I said, well, will you do it if you're a clown? And he says, okay. So that's how that came about. <laughs> and there's Jack with all the monsters. He was very happy. I wanted the monsters to be super tall, so I put, made the, the, again, masks filled with expanding foam mounted on bicycle helmets and then two pieces of foam for shoulders and then ca capes to cover the body and then the face. You could actually breathe through these uh, ribbons in the front of the face. And then some of my um, creatures were inside of this giant windmill uh, here's some of the monsters riding the little train and the conductor. Here they are riding the merry-go-round. Here they are outside mingling with the group of people. These are the, m the monsters that they want $5,000 to ship to Geneva, so I'm having a bit of a little issue with them not getting to go, whoa. So then the last, this is, I'm actually kind of winding up, whoa, come on, go back. Um, this is what I've been doing for the last three years, is I've been working on this feature film. I thought it to myself, well, once in my life I want to do a feature film because I thought, well, it's like just doing three half-hour films, but it turns out it's not. It's, 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 it's like an earthquake. It, it gets exponentially dif more difficult. So I wanted to do it based, uh, or inspired from a Hieronymus Bosch tableau where the actual characters come alive, like in a uh, tableau vivant. So these are all static c people pretending to be static and then they start moving. And the film um, was shot up at the T Zorthian Ranch, if any of you are familiar. It's this old ranch at the very top of Fair Oaks. And it's a collection of ramshackle houses, trailers, junk uh, collection. So I play the old witch. Um, I thought it would be an appropriate role, and my daughter plays the young witch. And she's 16, so it was an interesting challenge working with your teenage daughter who um, would actually probably in real life like to kill you as well as on film. <laughs> so. And here's... Uh, Baba Muthra and her group of scarecrows, and she's trying to plow the fields and create crops, but she's deranged, alcoholic, and um, really can't get anything together. So she wants her daughter to take over the whole coven, the whole farm, all the monsters. So she tries to trick her daughter into taking over the whole legacy. Oops. The daughter um, yearns to be free. She tries to teach the different birds how to fly. She says, if I could be free, I, if I could fly, I would be free. And it's the existential problem of entrapping oneself because she could actually crawl through the fence in the farm. But she, um, it takes her a long time. She meets some real teenagers. She's never met teenagers before, so she kind of gets the idea, maybe I should escape. Um, this is where Baba hangs out drinking with her witch friends who want her out too. They don't, they think she's an uh, old alcoholic. They want her to leave too. Um, Spirit Girls, yet again, make another appearance. Um, they're the backing band, this time in their more gothic look um, in the bar. And uh, this is when the daughter goes into a drug den and meets up with some of the drug characters and becomes a white witch. Um, this is, she finally gives in and goes through the ritual to become oh, the lead witch. 
I won't tell you the ending because it will be screening in Los Angeles, um, but there is a hole in the wall, so I'll let you know that there's a good chance. This is called The Day of Forevermore. And uh, I'll just say a little bit more about the movie and, and um, back to the first thing I started with, which was trying to do things that you've never done and forcing yourself to do them because I really um, was very nervous. I had never written a script. I had never um, worked with a crew. I was on a very small budget. I traded mostly art for people who worked on the crew. And um, then I sat, finally sat myself down. I said, okay, you're going to write the script. You've got a week. We're shooting. You've got to do it. Of course, that was a week I got called into jury duty. So <laughs> the whole script was written in the jury room, in the hall, on the floor. It was like a nightmare, but I got through it, and then um, it turned out just fine. So I think that as, I, I guess I'll want to conclude now, and I know that we all are going to go off into our day to pursue a lot of different things, a lot of different mediums, and if there's anything that you had one little tiny twinkle or glimmer of something that you always wanted to do, but you didn't think why bother, or you thought why bother, or I don't have time, or you know what's it going to get me in the long run, I certainly won't be paid for this one little thing that um, is just a new idea because I have my job or whatever. I, I recommend just going for it because um, you never know where it's going to lead you, and then when you look back on your entire life, at least you can, you can say to yourself, I tried a lot, I tried many things, and they all fed into each other. Well, thank you.